Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Savior, Jesus Christ. God's word for our meditation is the epistle lesson from Romans chapter 4, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Mathematician and thinker Archimedes once said, Give me a long enough lever and a place to stand, and I will move the world. Now, I don't think Archimedes actually thought that it would have been possible to build some sort of lever on which he could stand on the end of it and actually move the world, but it is quite a boastful statement. He's boasting in this great discovery that he made, this understanding of how a lever works, mechanical advantage, that technically speaking, if you could have a lever long enough, even one person could balance out the entire earth. And it makes one think that. Believers throughout history, whether it be today or or in the thousands of years the past since Abraham, it makes us think, did Abraham figure something out? That's the question that the Apostle Paul poses to the Romans. We see all of these blessings that God pours out to Abraham, all these promises that he makes to Abraham. He makes him the father of many nations. He promises such rich and vast things. What did Abraham figure out? Did Abraham figure out the secret of Christian living? Did he figure out the secret of how we please God, what we need to do to make God look with just a little bit more favor on us? It's a natural question to ask, and it's one that, even if we haven't thought of it quite in that same perspective, the natural mind thinks of all the time. It is why pagan religions are the way they are. It is why why people offer the sacrifices they do, even if they have no idea who the true God is. There's this thought, what's the secret? What do I got to do? And they'll grab onto anything. But the secret, which is no secret at all, is that it's nothing that Abraham did. And it's nothing that you must do. But it is the Lord himself, the Lord, who gives you righteousness. He gave it to Abraham and he gives it to you as well. Yes, if indeed Abraham had been justified by works, he'd have a reason to boast. Who of us, even if we have not done it with our lips, who of us has not boasted somewhere in the back of our minds as we look at others? We can draw lines everywhere. Draw lines between ourselves and people who do those sorts of things. I would never do that. I could never do that. I have never done that. And we draw lines between ourselves and others, thinking perhaps, even though we may have learned from youth that we're saved by grace and not by works, yet we think to ourselves, this is what really marks the difference. What really makes it okay for me to be with God, the real reason I know I'm going to be in heaven, is because I'm the way I am. I've done what I've done, and I haven't done those other things. And I suppose that gives us a reason to boast in this world. I suppose we could go out in the world and we could boast to the world about what we haven't done and what we have done, about our good works and our deeds. But first and foremost, we have no, would have no reason to boast before God. Even if Abraham had been justified by his works, he'd have no reason to boast before God. After all, he would simply have done what God had asked him to do. Be perfect. Be righteous in my sight. We still like to boast, though, don't we? What parent hasn't had their child? They've they've asked you've asked your child to do the same thing a dozen times in a row, day after day. Would you do this? Do this chore. You need to do this. You need to get this accomplished. And when, after the fifteenth time you've asked, they finally do it, then they come back and they boast. 
I did it. I did it. Well, yeah, you were supposed to do it, and I asked you to do it all those times. There's really nothing to boast about. And so as we hold our good works before the Lord, do we really have anything to boast about? Paul says, even if they were perfect, even if we could be perfect, we would still have nothing to boast about before God. And of course, that's a really big if, isn't it? If Abraham had been justified by works. But of course, he wasn't. He wasn't justified by his works. It wasn't the things that he did that made him him pleasing before God. Instead, Abraham believed God, and it was credited to him as righteous. It was given to him as a credit, not as an accomplishment. It was given as a gift, not as something that was owed. But wait a second. We... We know the story of Abraham. You you know some of the things that happened in Abraham's life. Didn't he do a lot of things? I mean, didn't he leave behind his family? Didn't he travel great distances? Didn't he didn't he fight battles? Didn't he 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 show his faith and demonstrate that faith over and over again? Didn't he pray boldly and confidently to the Lord? Didn't he do what God asked him to do and therefore God was pleased with him? Well, perhaps he did those things, yes. That may be the case. And yes, God is pleased with our works. He is pleased with our thankful living for him. But that's not the issue here. See, faith exists as this two-pronged thing. There are really two sides to the coin of faith. On one side, there is the living and active spirit that God has placed in us by his Holy Spirit. Faith. Faith that loves the Lord. Faith that brought you here this morning. Faith that leads you to love your neighbor. Faith that leads you to sing songs of praise to the Lord. That's faith. But that's not the aspect of faith that saves you. See, the other side of the faith coin is that faith receives from God. Faith humbly sits there and says, God did everything. I need to do nothing in order to receive eternal life. I mean, it it almost jars our sensibilities when Paul writes, but to the person who does not work, but believes in the God who justifies the ungodly. I mean, after all, God does tell us to work. He he tells us we shouldn't just sit on our backsides. We shouldn't be lazy. We shouldn't squander the gifts that he gives to us. But no, no amount of service to the Lord, no amount of obedience to his commands gets you any closer to heaven. You don't need to get any closer to heaven, do you? You already have it. Why would you be worried about trying to please God who's already said, I love you and I've forgiven you? Our works don't play a role in that. Instead, our works are just the natural outflowing of that faith that God has given to us. They are what happens when we have faith. And they are a sign of thankfulness to the Lord for that gift that he's given, the forgiveness of sins. There's a common expression, when your favorite sports team wins, you say, we won, right? We won the championship. But uh, unless you are a really, really gifted athlete, and I know I'm not, I know that if, if my team was somehow dependent, in order for me to say we won, I had to be on that field or on that court in the game. I know that the one thing that is certain is we would not have won. If my team was relying on me, we wouldn't win. How joyous it is that we can say we won heaven. 
It's ours. We have the victory. But don't go inserting yourself into the game because that's the one surefire way to lose. As soon as you start thinking that we have the gift of heaven because I've accomplished something, I've been pleasing to God, I've made him love me, I've won the victory, then, then you've lost that very victory that God won for you. You lose it not because God hasn't powerfully won the victory, but because that victory comes to you through faith, through believing in the promise. See, that gift of God, the promise, is what brings eternal life to Abraham and to you. And that doesn't come through the law. See, according to the law, there is absolutely nothing you can do that you are capable of doing that would make God, that would, uh, that, that would make God love you anymore. You think about that. Nothing you can do according to the law that would make God love you anymore. Unless you could be perfect. But even our righteous acts are filthy rags. And so we, we in obedience to the law, do our best. And God says, not good enough. You've fallen short. You still deserve hell. But of course, that statement doesn't stand on its own, does it? Because you see, according to the gospel, there's nothing you can do that would make God love you any less. God loves you. You sin, yeah. God loves you. You are right in his sight, not because you've been able to be a good enough person, not because you've done the right works, but because he loves you and has given you that gift of faith that receives that promise. Yes, it is received through faith. For where there is a promise, there needs to be faith. That's true really regardless of the situation in life. Granted, sometimes faith appears a little bigger, and sometimes faith appears a little bit smaller. On Christmas morning, when someone hands you a present, and it has your name written on it, and they say, this is for you, you wouldn't exactly say it's an act of faith to believe that that present is yours, but it is. It's not a leap of faith. It's an accepted, accepted and very believable thing, but it's still faith. The fact of the matter is, you could say, I don't believe it. You could push the present away. You could throw it in the garbage. You could say, it's not for me. You believe it because there's a promise, and that promise calls for faith. I suppose it stands a little, it appears a little bit different when God says, go to a land I've never, that you've never seen before that's inhabited by other people, and just trust me, I'm going to give it to your descendants. Descendants that, right now, you have no idea where they're going to come from because you have no children and you've been unable to have children. Descendants that, even though I've promised you a child, you're going to have to wait another 25 years or so to have that son. Nevertheless, trust me, where there is a promise, there's also that call for faith. And where God calls for faith, he also gives us faith. Faith in his promise that comes by the Spirit. Faith that humbly sits, does nothing, and says, God, I believe you will do what you said you will do. Because when it comes right down to it, you don't have any tangible way to know for sure that you are going to heaven. We have promises from God. Sure, Jesus' resurrection from the dead was tangible. They touched him with their hands. They saw him with their eyes. He rose. And that certainly gives us a great deal of confidence today, but we're still reliant on the promise of God. Because he lives, you too will live. And where God makes a promise, he calls for faith. And where God calls for faith, he gives us faith to believe what he has promised. None of us can stand before God if we're sinners. None of us can be in heaven 
if that stain of sin remains on us. And so the Lord makes a promise. You are righteous. You are right in my sight. You are clean and holy. Something that could only be accomplished by the gift of his son. Something that had to be won, earned, not by you, but with the blood of the Son of God poured out for your sins. And then God makes a promise that's yours. Through faith, you are righteous. Righteous in God's sight. That's the Lord's gift to you. Amen. <coughs>